Uh, good afternoon. So uh, I'm here to uh, talk to you about Eva particularly Australian perspectives on developments in our strategic environment in the Indo-Pacific and how Japan can work with Australia and other like-minded countries to contribute to peace and security across the region. I'm going to focus on uh, opportunities to enhance cooperation in Japan, between Japan and Australia, uh, specifically focusing on the Indian Ocean and Pacific uh, Island states. So I'll give you a picture there. That's the Indo-Pacific, really. Um, so Japan, Australia and other countries in our region are in the process of reimagining what our region consists of. We no longer see the Pacific and Indian Oceans as two entirely uh, separate strategic theatres. And instead, we're increasingly seeing interactions between the two regions, and that includes uh, China's uh, uh, activities into the Indian Ocean, and it includes India's activities in the Pacific, and a lot of uh, what a lot of other countries are doing uh, as well. And in fact, Prime Minister Shinzo Abe was really one of the first leaders of the world to talk about this when he made a famous speech uh, in front of the Indian Parliament in 2007 called The Convergence of the Seas. And many other countries have now followed uh, his lead, including Australia, which is one of the most enthusiastic supporters uh, of this idea. So the concept is really leading us to see the entire Asian littoral in, as, a, as a single strategic unit. And where that space begins and ends and how it actually works as a strategic space is certainly open to debate and many countries might have different perspectives. That's entirely fine and that's actually really quite understandable. But the most important thing is to understand that this strategic space really stretching from Japan uh, to Moors and even beyond really acts as a single strategic unit. Now the biggest change in the Indo-Pacific strategic environment is the rise of China. And the relative, and I, I stress the word relative, decline in US dominance. And in fact, the United States will be the major dominant power in the region for many, many years to come, but its relative uh, 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 dominance is in decline. But importantly, and this is really the, the key point of, of this talk, is it's not just about the US-China relationship. There are a lot of other important players in this region. Uh, the rise of India as a major power, for example, means that the India-China relationship is really the most important strategic relationship in the Indian Ocean. And similarly, among the Pacific Island states, uh, Australia plays a very important role, probably a more important role than the United States. And all this means is that the future strategic environment of the Indo-Pacific is not just about the United States and China. It'll be a complicated, multilateral environment where countries like Japan, Australia, France, and others play uh, important roles. Um, so I'll just show you this, this little chart which uh, tries to give you a bit of a feel of the changing balance of economic power between now and 2050. And you've got to take these numbers with a grain of salt because uh, any projections to 20, 2050 uh, is a very speculative, but they, they show some interesting numbers. These, these, these numbers are in purchasing power parity terms, and these numbers are in market exchange rate terms. Let's say purchasing power parity is, is probably more important. This shows you the relative uh, 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 aggregate GDP in 2050, at least according to PwC, uh, of each of these countries. And you can see, in purchasing power parity terms, and you can see the aggregate size of India, uh, uh, Japan, Indonesia, Saudi Arabia, Australia, Pakistan, Malaysia, uh, South Africa. And there are a lot of other countries that are not on this list, but 
I really put it up to <coughs> give you an indication that relative powers, relative economic power is going to change a lot over the coming decades. And for countries like Japan and Australia, it has really important um, implications. It means that we need to make new friends, form new relationships, form new alliances, even uh, in the coming, coming years. So this drift towards multilateralism uh, is spurring a whole set of complex new strategic geometries across the region. In the past, as we know, countries like Japan and Australia relied on their bilateral um, alliances with the United States, the so-called hub and spoke system. And this is changing in several ways. First of all, we're seeing new relationships being built between US allies, joining the hubs, that's called, uh, and the Japan-Australia security relationship is a perfect example of that. Previously, we only relied on the United States. Now we're working together. Uh, another trend is for closer bilateral security relationships between uh, countries within the US alliance system and countries outside the US alliance system. And security relationships between Japan and Australia and India, for example, is a great, is a great example of that. And a third trend is the establishment of what's called minilateral security dialogues. And so that involves informal, small groupings of states that come together to talk about security issues share perspectives, and perhaps uh, work together. And this is still developing in our region, but they could provide new structures uh, for cooperation in the Indo-Pacific, Indo -Pacific, and possibly new building blocks uh, in a future new multilateral world. And here, uh, and apologies for the graphics, it's uh, graphics are by me, so they're not terribly sophisticated, but uh, it shows you just some of the uh, minilateral groupings. You'll notice that many of them uh, have three parties, so they're trilateral. One example is the, uh, the India, Japan, Australia trilateral grouping involving meetings at uh, foreign secretary level, which has been a really incredibly successful <coughs> vehicle for exchanging views between those three countries on issues of shared concern. Another developing partnership, which I'll put down at the, the bottom here, is perhaps between Australia, India and France. The three Indian Ocean countries with the most capable navies. And another, yet another prospective triangle is focused on the Eastern Indian Ocean, uh, Involving, uh, where have we got it? It's not on this. There it is. Between Australia, India, and Indonesia, uh, uh, three of the most, uh, at least, militarily powerful states in the Eastern Indian Ocean. And yet another has, was uh, discussed earlier on: the quadrilateral between the United States, Japan, India, and Australia which was reformed in 2017 after a 10 year hiatus. And it's not yet clear what the next steps for the Quad will be, but uh, it will, it will uh, likely develop slowly and incrementally, uh, really providing the countries with a graduated response to assertive behavior by China. So there's a lot of scope for countries, for cooperation uh, among countries like Japan, Australia, the United States and India in uh, places as far apart as the Pacific Islands, the Indian Ocean. And one specific uh, area of cooperation is for the four quad partners to ensure that infrastructure is developed in the most beneficial way uh, for the region. In recent times, we've heard a lot of criticism about China's Belt and Road Initiative, talking about um, uh, debt, diplomacy, uh, etc. 
where, and there's an, a lot of instances where developing countries have gotten into a lot of trouble uh, on, um, on some of these uh, Chinese sponsored projects because they're economically unfeasible. I'm certainly not saying that that's the case in all of these projects, but it is the case for some of these projects. And really the key to respond to this, to help our region, is not to go and tell countries to say no. Because these countries need to develop, they need foreign investment, they need investment from China. The key to it is to provide alternatives. To say, okay, well, you've got this offer of an infrastructure investment from China, here are some other alternatives. You choose which, uh, which alternative you think is the best for you. And in my view, um, uh, the Quad countries can coordinate their efforts um, in this way. In fact, Japan is already sponsoring many infrastructure investments uh, in the Indian Ocean region uh, on a scale that rivals and sometimes exceeds investments by China. And in fact, if I have one criticism of Japan, uh, if I may today, is that Japan does not tell people how much work it is doing in this area, how much investment JICA is making right across the region. It's incredibly hard to obtain the information from JICA because uh, I don't think Japan is on the front foot in promoting all the great work that it's doing in the region. Similarly, the Quad countries can better coordinate their work among Pacific Island states. Pacific, uh, uh, previously there was little strategic thinking about the island states, but recent uh, projects announced to develop, and this is a great example, when uh, uh, Australia, Japan, United States and New Zealand got together to uh, develop the electricity system of uh, Papua New Guinea. Uh, and that was to, uh, to provide uh, New Guinea with an alternative to what many see as a, a very corrupt deal being promoted um, by China. And the Quad countries can also better coordinate uh, work with other countries, such as France, uh, in coordinating their activities in the Indian Ocean. I'll say a couple more things. One is that I should mention the importance of using Coast Guard agencies as a means of engagement within the region. Coast Guards have a great benefit of being able to work in places and work in ways and work with countries where navies cannot, because navies carry with that a lot of political baggage that Coast Guards don't. And in fact, Japan has long realised this. Japan has used its Coast Guard as a leading agency to engage with countries like Sri Lanka and many countries, uh, with any island, many island states in the Pacific uh, Ocean. And uh, similarly, uh, Australia and India and the United States use their Coast Guards to engage with many of these smaller countries, particularly countries that only have Coast Guards, many of them don't have navies. And so I have recently recommended that Japan, Australia, the United States and India form a quad of Coast Guards. And that would be bringing together the four Coast Guards of those four countries to better coordinate their activities right across the Indo-Pacific so that we don't double up in terms of capacity building in smaller island states, we allocate responsibilities, we coordinate our work. And in my view, a quad of Coast Guards would be a great way and really uh, a relatively non-controversial way of the four quad countries to work together much more effectively for the benefit of our region. So, in summary, I think we're standing at quite a critical point in the history of our region. Many people are talking about a new Cold War, Cold War II, beginning in the region. 
and I certainly, I certainly hope that that can be avoided. But we have to be realistic that we may not be able to avoid that. And it's essential, I think, to try and avoid that Cold War that uh, Japan, Australia, India and other like-minded democracies within our region work together. And this is going to require big changes for Japan. It's going to require uncomfortable changes in the way Japan does business. We all know that the nature of the Japan-US alliance, alliance is changing. And among other things, this will require a place a much greater burden on Japan than ever before. Uh, Japan will need to step up to shoulder that burden. Uh, but at the same time, I think it's very important that Japan understands that it has good friends uh, in this region. And certainly I can say that uh, Australia is, is one of them.